A huge welcome to BlockSub and today's science talk. As usual, we're here live from the Innovation Hub in Copenhagen, and we have participants both online and also here in the room. For uh, the ones of you who don't know me, for the ones that maybe haven't been here before, my name is Jule Rumpe, and I'm the host of this year's series of the science talks, and I'm the science coordinator here at BlockSub. With the science talks that we're hosting at BlockSub, we are giving science a platform and a voice. So we're inviting researchers to come and share their knowledge with us. And we're also inviting them to share best practices, just like we're going to probably hear today about transdisciplinary research. But before we hear more about that, as usual, I would also like to thank our partners for this year's series, which is the UIA, the International Union of Architects, and the World Congress of Architects, which was hosted this year in July here in Copenhagen. And since the science talks are somehow framing the Congress that happened here in, in July, we also took over their Congress theme, which is leave no one behind. It is a universe, or the universal value on how to achieve the sustainable development goals. So we took a little twist on the theme, and for the science talks, we had the theme of leave no one and nothing behind. But same as the UIA, we have also identified that architecture and urban design are a key driver in achieving the sustainable development goals. But finally, let's shift our focus on today's science talk and to these three gentlemen. I'm going to try and keep it short to not steal too much time, but it's actually quite difficult because you all have very interesting profiles. But let's start with Phil. He is a professor in biohybrid architecture at the Royal Danish Academy, and he's currently leading an EU-funded project which is investigating engineered living materials, which I'm sure we will hear more about. Seraphim, he is a professor at, uh, of dairy technology at the Department of Food Science at the Copenhagen University, and he's currently leading a project about the use of digital tools to predict the behavior of powders. And then last but not least, Dennis, he's a professor in microbiology and fermentation also at the Department of Food Science at Copenhagen University, and he's heading a program for solid state fermentation for protein-based transformation and palatability of plant-based foods. And for the ones of you, just like me, that have no idea what palatability is, it means tastiness of foods. And correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so as you can see, we have like three top class speakers today. And from the intros that you've heard and also the title about alliances, you can probably see that we will touch upon breaking down silos today, which is one of my favorite things to discuss about. So enough for me today. As usual, there will be time for a Q&A session afterwards. So for the ones of you online, feel free to already post questions in the chat and then we'll come back to them later. And for the ones of you in the room, as usual, you can come forward with questions afterwards. So now, Phil, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. So I'll just grab my phone over here so I can keep time. And uh, so here are the slides. So I mean, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and talking and to be doing this together with Seraphim and Dennis. Uh, and I'm going to set the scene um, talking about building with living cells, which I think is quite a novel territory in an architectural context, but not so novel from a food context. Um, now, of course, the, it's very well quantified, uh, the kind of negative impacts that our industry, the building industry, are, are creating in terms of uh, environmental degradation, both in terms of the production of materials, but also in terms of uh, occupation and use. Um, and one of the key drivers here is the, the fact that we're still operating very much in kind of linear paradigms of consumption, which are referred to as this take, make and waste paradigms. Um, the discussion about circularity has been going on for many, many decades. Um, and of course, the ambition is to aim for this kind of um, situation where we're absolutely minimizing the amount of wastes. But the actual reality, um, unfortunately, is that we're, we're actu actually, in real terms, getting a widening gap in terms of our, our circularity. So um, in 2018, uh, we actually had a situation where we were um, uh, able to uh, have cir circularity back 
at 90.9% off, but now we're at 92.8% off. So we're actually only recycling 7.2% um, of our raw material base. And this is largely due to the fact that essentially what's happening is that we've got a rising, in, we've got an increase in material extraction. Um, and that isn't just across the building sector. So this, these are across all sectors. Um, but what is really interesting then is when we look at that and we look at the, uh, the, the pro projections of consumption over the next um, 40 years, where based on uh, pressures to do with demand of increasing urbanization and population growth, it's anticipated that we're going to have to double the quantity of our raw material supply. And yet we know that we are running out of some of these key resources. There is a resource scarcity issue. So this really sets you know, a, a, a deep problem in how it is that we start to try and rethink where our material base can actually start to become expanded. And so this is where um, this EU project, the Fungal Architectures Project, started to look at the idea of how it is that we might employ solid-state fermentation, as Eula mentioned that Dennis is doing, um, in the context of producing building materials. Uh, and what becomes interesting here is not to just think about we're wanting to produce materials, but how is it that through the engagement with living organisms, we might start to actually rethink what architecture could be. So in this particular project, you know, there were four key aspects looking at the constituents of the materials, how it is that we can produce fungal composites, looking at the actual dynamics of the organism itself in a computational sense, and starting to move towards fungal constructions. Uh, these were the partners in, in the project, three academic partners and one industrial partner, Mogu, who actually um, are producing um, building components in, in, in the context of both flooring and also acoustic absorbers, which are already on the market. Um, in this project, we were very keen to try and move beyond the idea that all we're doing is simply creating, using these new materials to create replacements. But how, it is, how is it that we might be able to rethink through this new material base what architecture could be, how it might embody new kinds of ethics and values? So just to take us um, into uh, an understanding of what the organism is, we're working with fungal mycelium. Uh, this really operates at a, at a very low scale in terms of the um, core structure of mycelium, which is the fungal hypha, which uh, essentially exists at around two, two microns diameter. But this very, very quickly propagates and produces a net around what you're providing, which is essentially its foodstuff. So what becomes interesting <clears throat> here is that the foodstuffs that we can be giving for the binding of uh, this mycelium and to create components can actually be from uh, waste residues, both from agriculture, from forestry, uh, and other biological uh, waste residues. And these are really in abundance um, in, in a European context. So what becomes very interesting here is that by working with this organism, we can also be producing um, components at quite accelerated scales in time. So we have a 10-day pre-inoculation that's occurring. Oh, sorry, that's uh, oh, going backwards here. Let me go back here and try and get the pointer. Ah, there we go. So this is the 10 days pre-inoculation. Uh, this is to ensure that we're getting non-contaminated um, material. Uh, and then we can break that down and put it into a mold um, at around 10 days and leave it to grow for about another week to 10 days, depending on the kinds of quality that we want. And you can see that uh, essentially over that time, we can achieve really quite interesting conformity to the, the kind of um, uh, molds that we're, we're placing this in. Uh, 
And so uh, the project that we've been looking at has been uh, investigating what the principal design strategies are for producing these kinds of materials. And in the state of the art, these are, are very much focused around notions of supplementation. What additives do we add to the stock? Notions of densification. How is it that we actually post-process the material? But we were very interested in this space here, compositions, a drawing upon previous research looking particularly in the world of composites, where we know that orientation of um, key elements or differentiated elements can be a, a very interesting design vector for being able to tune properties of materials. And so this, this is what we were doing here, and we set up um, uh, a, uh, an experimental plan looking at a whole range of different um, uh, ways of structuring the bulk volume of these materials and also looking at the impact in terms of the matrix material and the, the size of it and, and the geometries of it. And so we ended up coming to this situation where we found that we could produce very, very different mechanical properties um, in these materials through very, very frugal means. And you see here that essentially uh, when we're looking at the um, elastic modulus here, uh, we're, we're really sitting in the world of foams. So the, these kind of materials can't be used as primary structural elements. But what is interesting is that as we start to look at um, refining these kind of um, anisotropic strategies, uh, we can actually start to move and, and really push the performance of materials quite far beyond what the state of the art is showing. Still not dealing with you know, primary structural elements, but certainly talking about vectors uh, where we can be moving towards different functional poles for, um, for these materials. And of course, they also breed a kind of new aesthetics. Um, so what becomes very interesting here is the way in which you get extreme differentiation starting to occur depending on the kinds of food stocks that you're providing the organism. Uh, and you see here these 49 panels uh, have just been arranged uh, and this uh, planetary boundaries exhibition that this forms a part of is opening uh, this afternoon up at the Royal Academy so you can go along and have a look at, at these materials uh, directly. Um, so in, in that EU project, we've been looking very much at the idea of using the organism, but then essentially arresting the organism to be able to produce materials with fixed properties. In this new project, Fungataria, what we're looking at is bringing mycelium-based materials into an engineered living materials context. And what that means is essentially engineered living materials is a relatively new field um, that is looking to make materials that embody or um, are composed of living cells and keeping the cells viable in use case scenarios. So the aim here is to look at, uh, well, let me just describe the partners. So we have six academic partners in the project, uh, two of them from our previous project, uh, but now also including synthetic biology from Ghent University, microbiology from Vrij University, and the University of Oslo uh, that are, are looking after issues to do with ethics, uh, um, legal and societal aspects of, of, of this work. And just to describe essentially the aims of ELMs, this is from a paper by one of the leading researchers in this field, Peter Nguyen, uh, from uh, the WIS Institute. And the aim really is to look at how it is that we can be intervening really down at this low scale here, so that what we can be doing is leveraging the mechanisms of biological growth to be moving through different hierarchies of scale and structure towards producing um, designed objects. And in our context, uh, we're looking at how it is that we might be making materials that can exhibit self-healing. Uh, so this is in an exhibition at the Venice Biennale at the moment. This is work produced by our partner VUB um, and specifically by, um, sorry, I'm trying to find the pointer here. Um, specifically by um, Elise El Saka and uh, Simon van der Luke. 
And you see here, you've got a pure mycelium sheet that's been cut. This is the same stock of mycelium sheet, and you see that, it, that the material's actually healed itself. It leaves a witness, but it has actually become reconnected. So this idea that we can start to work towards materials that, by keeping them alive, start to exhibit self-repair, self-organization, um, and I, I think this opens up a really interesting space where um, we can start to talk about new kinds of connectivities back into ecologies, which could start to become a, a very interesting vector for rethinking um, the, the kind of outputs of, of buildings, especially. In our particular work, we're, we're looking at trying to produce these and control the production of pure mycelium foam. Uh, but the other aspect of this is really about trying to understand from a modeling perspective how it is that we can start to uh, work towards achieving a uh, predictable outcome. So that describes the work that we're after, and I'll pass now to Seraphim. I will try to continue. So I will try to continue and maybe extend what Phil was saying. Uh, I can make the slides work. <laughs> So I'm a, I'm a food process engineer by training, and I spend most of my life trying to design foods. And it's an interesting thing because design by itself means different things to different people. So what I would try to tell you a little bit about is what are challenges in the foods, and maybe you can see some commonalities. Try to tell you a little bit about food materials, how we design them and what they are and then go and open up the questions where Dennis is going to continue a little bit more with the physical science. So if you read the news, food is, starts becoming for similar reasons for sustainability in the news, not always for good reasons, right? You know, you read The Guardian or you read The New York Times, there's quite often an article about the impact food has on the planetary boundaries, right? We're exceeding them. And it makes sense, it's one of the core activities. 10% of our income Anything between 10 to 30 percent is spent for food, right? It's one of the key activities, the key activity we have to do as human beings to sustain life. And what is important in this sustainability food trail is that 15 percent of the gas emissions are one spot from, from the foods. The land use, more than 25 percent of the land use is to produce foods. And that's a very critical aspect. We need to reduce that. So at the same time we're spending all of this energy and all of the time to produce, 30% of the food is wasted. It doesn't even reach that place. And that is common in the developing and in the developed world. So we're spending a lot of energy, a lot of resources to produce foods that we don't consume. And I, I, I sort of have a provocation. If food actually is good for you, right? How good is the food we produce for us? So 8 million people died from tobacco. Three million died from alcohol. How many do you think they died from food-related diseases? Any guess? Twelve. So we're spending a lot of energy producing food, then we throw it, and then 12 million people kill from dietary risks. And the challenge here is not equal. If you see at the diabetes prevalence, most of it happened in low- and middle-income countries where the health system is not very good due to dietary shifts. So we, we faced with, you know, within the foods with the challenge, which is really asymmetric. And, and that's what we're trying to resolve. So we have to make sure we address it quite soon. And the question then comes, how do you design food? So I had a picture from the Noma Fermentation Lab on the top, and then a scientist in the bottom, right? So it could be like really culinary, when you talk about food design, all of, most of us think of high end, and in reality, to get an idea of the industry, this is numbers from EU, 1% of the companies produces 50% of the food. And if you go to any supermarket, you notice it, right? It's the 10 big guys, big companies that produce. So we really centralize the production and it's mass produced from a small number of companies that they turn up 40% of employment and 40% of the turnover, right? Just to give you an idea on the sort of context we're working on, and then, how do you do food? We go to the material science. So in essence, you start with the material, eggs, and depends how you process it, you can turn different foods. If you think of it as bricks, right? You start with sand, I can make anything. I can make omelette, sauce hollandaise, or I can probably even make 
you know, egg drop noodle soup. And that all depends how we change the ingredients. So a lot of the time what we end up doing, trying to fine tune what are the conditions and what is the interactions between the process and the materials to produce certain function. So it's very similar to what Phil was mentioned, only we do it for foods. Right? So this was a lot of work we've done in the UK as part of a 10-year center that was funded to really try to understand what is the interactions between the process and the materials to give you the structures. So we're really try, trying to drive the structure. And I'll give you an example here. This is a blast from the past. This is when fat, when, I don't know if you remember the 80s, where everything had to be low, middle, low fat. So this is how low fat mayonnaise was built. This is a confocal image of low fat mayonnaise. So the green is the oil, it's spherical droplets, emulsions, and the red is the starch. So in the beginning, people try to put starch to match the viscosity, right? But you can see there's no way the red is gonna behave the same as the green. Like it just, it doesn't adapt. So then after quite a few years of trial and error, people thought we really need to go and design these things. So when you look then at mixed biopolymers, if you move gelatin and maltodextrin, this is a protein and a carbohydrate, these things don't like each other, and they tend to split. So that was very well known. That's very interesting. If they split, I can utilize that. And if you change the concentrations, there are certain areas you can make a gelatin continuous, a maltodextrin continuous, or a bicontinuous matrix. So by adjusting the concentrations, and the ratios of salts and sugars, you can go up and fine tune your structures to exactly how you want them. So now you're taking your starts out and you're mixing proteins, your carbohydrates to produce droplet size to give you the performance you want. And this is what happened in then. I mean, this is one of the many examples of full fat mayonnaise and then mayonnaise with CL gel, basically these droplets from uh, bicontinuous phases. And you can match very similar, your properties match, right? You can go and match them. And that was done by understanding the structure, by going and adjusting the parameters and controlling them. And then we went, we, we've done some work almost 20 years ago when corn was starting, before actually it became corn, the way you, you know it. So we put, we put yeast cells in the flow and you can see the yeast cells aligning. So we have extra levers now to go back and say, you give us a living material, we can move it around and then the cells would align to give you the properties. And what was actually kind of cool, literally, we cooled them, we froze them at different degrees. So if you freeze them slowly, you create very big ice crystals and then the yeast cells align like this. You can really make fibers. So you freeze them at very low temperatures, very, very slow. If you freeze them fast, they don't align. So we, we develop the abilities to play with materials and develop structures we want because that's what the consumers want. And then we went, after that, we went to ask really, I'm a professor of dairy products. So the question really is, wh what is food? Uh, you know, I mean, you have to go really deep. And I said, but wow, you know, what is really food? What does it make sense? So I obviously asked SADPD to tell me what is food. And it gave that food is something that provides you with materials that you need to live. But also there's a whole range of different vectors beyond nutrition. There's a cultural aspect, there is significance, the psychological and so on. And when you're eating, actually, this is a a commercial from Unilever, people eating ice cream, they, they don't need mix, mixed materials, right? They eat ice cream. So what is the experience you need to provide to people? So we spent, I spent about two years in a center for a digital economy. And really, uh, the idea there is how can you leverage value out of the digital economy by, by pronouncing and by augmenting the consumer experience? And I mean, there was a lot of questions about aesthetics and ontology, and how do you map objects, and how can you use the digital tools to augment the value of an object. So this was one of my favorite pet projects. But first we had to ask, you know, is there inequality? Just trying to understand how consumers behave. Is there any correlation between quality versus price? So we took data from the wine magazine, so this is not a blind test, and we plot them versus the score, thinking that there must be. I mean, if you pay more for wine, it must be better, right? It turns out that if you pay more than $200, like per bottle of wine, most probably you're not gonna buy a bad bottle of wine, right? Apart from that, my statistician friends would say there is a correlation, I would say it's rather weak. And when you look at the vocabulary, 
people start to describing, they talk about the beauty of a wine, right? And this is the outlier, a relatively cheap bottle of wine, only 30 euros. But then there was this bottle which cost $150, and this was a curious wine. So, you know, it's interesting to see from a design perspective now, for the products we design, I mean, what is a curious wine? I have people come and ask me, can you come up with an experiment to produce a curious wine? I was like, like how, how do you even do that? And so this design space starts becoming quite interesting if we need to convince people to change the way what they eat. And then, as part of the digital platforms, we moved on to hybrid products. So the idea here is there's a physical product. This is, in reality, my daughter's card when we invited them, her friends, for for her name day. Name days is really important for Greeks, right? You invite all of your friends, it's a very big party. So this is the part, the card, and this is the cake that she made. So this is an object, and this is a card. What we've done is we 3D scan the card, and we make a QR code of the card. So now, what was an ephemeral food became digital, transcribed, and would have it in the memory. So you could scan the card, and, you know, the cake will come up, and then we augmented the, we augmented the experience, we augmented with, with the history of how you made the cake. So, you could see my daughter making the cake, or information about how, how the cake was made. So now, what was a, an, an ephemeral tool, became actually loaded with information with the history with a story. So, and that was one of the ideas, one of the areas we're developing in design. How can we augment the existing objects with more narratives? And what are the narratives that we need to make sure we move to plant-based diets, right? We really need to find every little lever of augmenting this space to be able to, to have people eating more sustainable. So that's why I think for us, some of the some of the discussions here is, is really about what are the other non-material elements of the design that would help people moving towards a transition. And I would leave for Dennis to talk a little bit more about actual foods. So, some slide mark. But, yep, there I am. Uh, food mark world is trying to do some architecture perhaps uh, but what we actually work at uh, on is trying to create plant-based fermented foods for the future and the reason is that august 2nd this year we had already spent all the resources available on on planet earth for this year so it's what we call earth overshot day um, meaning that for the rest of the year we are not supposed to use any resources which will be pretty hard uh, and if we look at uh, Denmark, we're over here, March 28th, we already used all our resources available for this year. Um, so that means that for the, for the remaining nine months of the year, we should actually not really use any resources. And of course, there are many uh, sinners here, uh, but the one I'm working with is uh, food. And as Seraphine said, quite a lot of our environmental impact actually comes from the food that, that we eat. And one of the big sinners is this cute guy. Uh, if you, can I point? I can point up here, yes. You see here, this is the kilo of CO2 equivalents needed to produce 100 gram of protein. And if you go for a beef, around 50 kilos of CO2 equivalents to produce 100 grams of protein. So that's a relatively expensive steak on your plate from an environmental uh, perspective. You can also go to this not so bad guy and they are down here, chickens, poultry here. They are around five kilos or so per uh, 100 grams of protein. And uh, poultry chickens are actually extremely efficient in turning feed into protein and meat. So uh, if, if you are going to eat meat, then uh, well, go for the chicken perhaps at least uh, once in a while. But we also have the really good guys down here, uh, pulses, lentils, etc. Where you see down here that the environmental impact per uh, 100 grams of, of protein is actually very, very low. The problem is that they can be a little bit boring to eat in the long run, especially if this is the main part of your diet. Uh, also partly mentioned by my colleagues, we use around one third of the arable land for producing feed for, feed for livestock production, so not, uh, not for food, but for feed. And if you turn that into food without putting it through an animal first, we could actually feed uh, 4 billion people more on planet Earth without using more land. 
So there are good reasons to try to change towards a more plant-based diet, but the big problem is that the plant-based alternative here is pretty far from the nice juicy steak we have here. So when you bite the thing in the middle, well, you have something in your mouth and stuff is happening, but when you uh, bite the steak, then you have many, many things are happening. There's structure, there's juices leaving into your mouth and taste chains and there's umami and God knows what. So we really, really like the beef on the left. And in relatively rich society like Denmark, we are not getting our consumers to switch unless things are delicious. Now other uh, uh, challenges, one challenge is, uh, well, perhaps if we look up here first, this is the essential amino acids, so the amino acids that we cannot create ourselves as humans. And what we have on the right here, this is uh, animal produce, animal protein, and here we have the, uh, the plant-based. And you can see there's actually a decent amount of essential amino acids in most plants. But the problem is, for instance, down here where we have lysine and methionine, well, I'm, not really, I'm not super good at controlling this one, but you see here, for instance, that for methionine, which is one of the essential amino acids that we cannot make ourselves, you really have to have the black belt nutrition to get that from plants alone. Whereas if you go and have a glass of milk, an egg, or uh, eat a, a steak, well, then you're actually uh, doing pretty well from an amino acid composition point of view. But what I'll talk about today is more the texture, because this is where Phil and I, we met each other. Uh, I visited him in, out there at the Royal Academy, and we found out after a relatively short time that we're doing exactly the same, except that he's doing it in a lot larger scale than I am. So I think I'm sort of perhaps 1% the size of, of Phil's stuff, but uh, besides that, we're doing the same. So what can we do? Well, we can try to get inspired by the world. And uh, for instance, in Indonesia, they are, uh, well, at least they still have a few months to go before they have used all their resources. And of course, they do eat meat out in Indonesia, but they also eat an awful lot of tempeh, which is a mold fermented uh, in Indonesia soy-based uh, product, solid. Uh, you can see it down here in the uh, leftmost corner. Uh, but the trick here is that you have a mold, a fungi, that basically creates, that's the white part that binds together uh, your otherwise relatively boring soya and then you get structure. And if you then marinate it the right way, for instance, then when you chew it, there's actually fun stuff going on in your mouth. Which means that if you're having a, a dish out there, there will often be tempe on the same place on that meal plate where you would normally find meat in a Danish context or European context, for instance. Which makes that dish a lot more environmentally friendly. It's relatively uh, neutral in taste, so you can easily marinate uh, your in direction so you get uh, interesting stuff to, to eat. Uh, and you can also just uh, deep fry it and put salt on, and then it's like a super tasty snack, which is perhaps my favorite. But my point, main point here is actually that you can use fungi just like Phil is using to build big structures. You can make uh, use fungi to create smaller structures that can actually eat and that creates interesting textures in your mouth. So, of course, the tempeh in the middle is not exactly like the steak, but it's a good starting point for... Uh, for creating interesting food, plant-based. And this is what we are working on. So one of the projects is a relatively big Novo Nordic Foundation, the big unc rich uncle in Danish science now, funded project uh, called uh, ProFerments, where we take two raw materials that we are familiar with in a European context or Danish context, yellow pea and oat, but it's also two raw materials that we use quite a lot for feed today. They are both relatively high in protein already. Um, and uh, then we combine that with uh, three groups of microbes. We have some uh, bacteria here, and that's a long story why we ended up on bacillus. Uh, but one part is that they, at least if you control them right, create some uh, flavors that uh, are quite rich in umami. And this is also what we associate with, with meat. So that means if you control them the right way, you can turn your plant-based food into something that resembles not meat, but gives you the same sensation in the mouth, so you're not missing the meat. And then we have Ritsupus that I just mentioned, that's the guy that makes the uh, aspect, that makes the tempeh, among others, and then we have another group of, of uh, moles, Aspergilli. Those of you who are very much into gastronomy know them as uh, koji moles. Um, but again, they are really good at breaking down things. Ritsupus are really good at making structure, and if you combine the right way, you can party 
degrade your food stuff and then build structure at the same time. And perhaps if you can put in the bacillus the right way, it might even taste well. So this is, I think, Phil slow to show the same slide, just to illustrate my point that we are doing the same stuff, just in different scale. You had the supplementation down here, where you add, so for instance, some calcium or whatever to give better structure. And what we do is that we add microbes to give better structure to our uh, fungal fermentations. So Mark, could you start the my only animation? Yes. So what you see here, this is a relatively ugly animation, but nevertheless, the the the, the things growing through the mass is uh, that's actually real fungal uh, hyphae. So that's the hyphae you see moving through the matrix. And in the background, you have some of these bacillus that we are talking about before. But what is interesting here from a microbiological point of view is that the red, the colors uh, represents enzymes. And the tip of the hyphae that is in front has another enzymatic profile than the tips that are a little bit behind, which kind of makes sense because the mole is interesting in, interested in getting some, some nutrients. And the front hyphae eats the easy stuff. The next one has to eat more difficult stuff, and those that are even more behind have to eat even more difficult stuff. Um, by controlling that, you can then control the enzymatic profile, and when you control the enzymatic profile, you're also <coughs> controlling the texture of your food. On top of that, there's something really cool here, because what you have here, the, uh, the line that you see, that's actually, again, one of these hyphae. If you have left rye bread too long, uh, a little bit too moist, you will see the hyphae growing on your rye bread, perhaps. It's kind of the same thing we see here, just in, on intention. And the uh, more green thing that lights up there, that's a bacterium. This bacterium is a Bacillus subtilis, one of the guys we are working with. And what they do, they're motile. But if you have really small bacterium moving through a big piece of whatever, it takes a long time. But here, they are using the, the fungal hyphae as a highway. So they move along the highway, and when they get to the tip of that, uh, that the, the hyphae grows from the tip, so it grows like this, then they secrete thiamine or B1 vitamin, as we know it. And fungi loves that. So they grow faster, and bacillus gives more thiamine, and they grow faster. And by doing so, we actually have like nice symbiosis here, where the bacterium is influencing how fast the, uh, the, fungi, the fungus is growing. Just like when Phil adds, uh, adds calcium, we are adding bacillus to control this. And we are right now investigating uh, many things, and it's just a simple illustration of some of the things we are, we are doing here. So for instance, up here, you imagine that each red dot here is uh, one spore from, uh, from, from one of the fungi we're working with, and now we inoculate so they're evenly spread. If we then do it like this instead, where we add in uh, the bacteria, and perhaps we only add the bacteria in the two sides, we will have something that has different texture here than in the middle, for instance, because we have these thiamine-producing bacteria here in, the, in between the fungal cells, or fungal uh, the spores. Or we could do it like this, where we put them close together in microcolonies, and that also again means we'll have a different enzymatic profile and thus a different structure of, of the foodstuff. And of course we can then add the bacteria and then continue to play. Which is pretty cool because that means that by controlling this, and of course you can control temperature, etc., etc., we end up with very, very different textures. And that's a good starting point for chefs to create something that is interesting to eat. We also, uh, we haven't really started now, but you can quite easily 3D print food. Seraphim can do that, for instance. Uh, and we are going to make molds where you can then sort of have the mold growing around. And then again, you end up with something that has hopefully even more interesting textures so that in the future we will have less meat on our plate but we will not miss it because there's something super cool uh, still lying there fulfilling the same role so you still leave that meal uh, satisfied in, in, in all senses. And that was my words. So. Uh It's actually amazing. I think all three of us kept time. That has never happened before. <laughs> yes, perfect. And that actually gives us now 20 minutes for some Q&A. But before we dive in, I would give you like a minute to just digest actually what you just heard. So for the ones of you online, feel free to now formulate some questions. And for you in the room, I would encourage you to just turn around and speak to your neighbor.
and also do some networking and maybe see if you can come up with some questions that you would like to ask the gentlemen or some comments and then we come back. All right. Should I turn down his? Or is it fine? Oh. On the stage, and then we can. Uh, can I borrow you, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, maybe on the side. So now I'm curious to see what you guys came up with. Do you have any questions for the gentleman? I s yes. And then, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rika. No, just curious on a, on a sort of, because obviously we're in, uh, in lack of time in order to really get moving on, on doing things in a better way. And we need to learn from each other to a much larger degree as you're doing here. So maybe just your insights on how do we, because everybody talks about it, right? We need to collaborate across sectors. We need all of these things. How do we actually go about doing it? What is your practical experience on what works, but maybe also what are some of the barriers that we need to overcome? Well, I mean, I'll start from um, <laughs> my, my experience, particularly through these EU funded projects is, you know, that it, we really need to find new kinds of alliances with transdisciplinary um, partners that can bring very, very different knowledge into um, particularly the kind of um, production of materials for the built environment. So, I mean, this is where I feel that we, we can really hit, you know, innovation uh, and and look towards completely new kinds of paradigm, and I, I think you know that it for for me it's been very fruitful to do that through through alliances with disciplines that we wouldn't normally associate with the built environment. This is this is how we kind of are able to kind of break free of um, essentially um, a, a kind of uh, common mindsets. Uh, so so for me, you know, I. I and why uh, I've then looked towards Seraphim and Dennis is that you know, they have the expertise looking at the very same kinds of organisms that we're working with and the same processes, solid state fermentation. So, you know, you could see in Dennis's slides, he's, he's, he's demonstrating so much more knowledge about uh, the capabilities and the nuances and essentially the complex phase space of an organism operating through... Um, uh, a bulk mass and talking about how it is that you can kind of nuance the control of this to be able to produce different kinds of enzymes or different kinds of structures. And I'm looking at that thinking, wow, I could really make use of that knowledge because the moment we can talk about accelerating the growth of something and understanding how it might be changing its, its branching topology, that will have an impact on mechanical performance. So, you know, it's, it's about how it is that we don't need to start reinventing the wheel, but by having alliances with, with people like Dennis and Seraphim, we can, we can actually be um, a, approaching making impact a lot quicker, which is get back to 
exactly your point that we're running out of time. So we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. And that's why we need to be looking towards uh, these you know, highly transdisciplinary um, collaborations. Perhaps I can, I can continue in the sense that when I came to you the first time, it was so clear that that creating structure is also something you do when you do it in a lot of a very different ways than, than we do. But, but we still had this common ground where we could meet and it was so clear that, that we could get inspired. But also that I think we, are, we all sort of relatively uh, have a practical approach to things so that you try to make things that are recognizable but new and we try to make things that are recognizable but new so it, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter if we come up with something completely alien to people on the plate or as a building material because nobody will use it. So we need to make something that, that has the right properties and it can be new and novel but it still has to have something that, that you recognize because otherwise the entry uh, the step is simply too, too big for for the vast majority of consumers and then we don't move anything and maybe i will continue i mean the first point of innovation and you know as anybody who walked out there knows it is see something else adapted that is the fastest way right an adaptation so in principle what you were saying look at solutions in other domains and try to adapt them is the easiest usually the buyers are that the devil is on the detail uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it seems like a good idea, but, you know, ah, there's something always a little bit more technically. The context is different, you know, the conditions, the time scale. So, you know, there needs to be maybe the adaptation might not be as easy as it would seem in the beginning. And at least my experience from, uh, from the discipline projects, it comes down to people. Uh, you really have to find people who have the energy to, to grow it because it is complicated. My first ever project was, was a professor of mathematics from Imperial. I mean, he was a guy close to retirement, and I was like a junior, <laughs> junior academic. So he grilled me for half an hour to agree on the vocabulary. And I thought, you know, he was really asking me, like, you know, do, do, if I know the stuff. I mean, it was, he was really direct as well, by the way, very intimidating. And then quite often what we're finding out, the vocabulary is very different. Mm. You try to work the, the disciplinary and then you really need a period of, I would say, six months to a year, depends how, how experienced the people are, to make sure when I say material, or when I say design, the design is a classic one. When I say design, everybody means something else. So one of the biggest barriers is really, you know, having this first lag phase of making sure we have the same methodologies, we have the same vocabulary, and we actually can find you into the same target, because otherwise uh, it, 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 can be, it can be challenging. And then in then, you know, and that's what I hope we try to do here, it has to be a clear win from both sides. So for my side, it was really ex you know, exciting talking to people from a different discipline, because for, I really need design a different type of design on my products, right? So then it becomes an interesting methodological point for me as well to go back and intemper it. And some of my interests discussing with the architects is how does the built environment affects what we eat? Can we, why are we so set on kitchens that we don't use? Can we go back and set the whole game now to be able to address our problem? So we also have something to go back and translate from these methodologies as well. I mean, there's there's another aspect to this, you know, because I, I think we were talking about entry points through perhaps you know the the study of the organism and the way that operates, and that, that really takes a kind of particularly engineering and technical perspective. But I, I think that the, which is the low hanging fruit and the kind of point by which we start to connect. But I think the, the kind of real interesting target, um, and I've seen this through both Dennis and Seraphim presenting in different contexts, is that ultimately they're interested in user experience and, and constructing sensations for people. And that, that's where I kind of think. Wow, actually, these guys are kind of closet architects. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, everybody and, and, is. And, and so, so, so this is where I suddenly, you know, became very excited because, you know, we have an immediate point of entry, which is from the technical, but ultimately we could be talking about how it is that we create new kinds of products, new kinds of services, new kinds of environments that have the possibility of embedding new kinds of ethics and values that can can help us move toward move away from where we currently are. And I, I think you know that that for me is yeah. the is the kind of grand design opportunity. Cool. 
Thank you for that extended answer. <laughs> <laughs> the answer should be yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any more questions? Oh, two. And then we can also see if there are some questions online afterwards. Uh, hi, I'm Lena. Um, thanks for the presentations. I'm wondering about uh, electrical conductivity. Are you doing any research on that in terms of, I don't know, battery storage capacity or uh, data storage capacity, anything like that? Uh, not, not in terms of power, but um, in bo both the Fungal Architectures project and the Fungataria project, our partner from um, uh, the University of West of England, Bristol, um, Professor Andrew Adamatsky, he runs the only wet computation lab in the UK. Um, and he's very interested in um, looking at bioelectrical activity, uh, being able to actually generate new kinds of data, being able to actually generate new kinds of data and data processing in these organisms. So he, he's, he, you know, from his perspective, he's looking very much at a future where we have run out of key resources for making standard substrates for computation and looking towards organisms as being new kinds of novel substrates that you can project computational logics into. And you can reverse it and use electricity, for instance, to actually control your, your microbial growth directed like that. And again, then you're back to designing stuff in, in novel ways. Mm. Cool. Then there was the question here. First? Uh, yes. Is it on? Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question for Phil, because uh, I've worked with mycelium before, and especially with using it as an ELM, it strikes me that there's two uh, potential issues with it, especially for uh, keeping it as like a living building material. One is the fact that it produces carbon dioxide as it grows, and it also tends to grow in like very rich carbon dioxide um, environments, like up to 20%, which is not so great for humans, uh, which could die at 1% or 4% uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. And then the other uh, issue with mycelium is that, um, well, it's a spore essentially. So I was told a horror story at Delft of an artist that didn't bake his mycelium fully before installing it in a very old art museum. And the spores got into the HVAC system and destroyed a bunch of very old art. Um, so <laughs> actually, I was just curious if you're developing any strategies to deal with these sorts of things through your research. Uh, well, so, I mean, you, you are talking about all the kind of risks that we are very much aware of. And I mean, certainly when we started the Fungal Architectures Project, there was a certain level of naivety about the idea, well, we can use this organism to grow buildings and, you know, we could start to have things, you know, adapting over time. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the levels of CO2 that, that um, uh, are produced metabolically push, push concentrations, I mean, essentially into, you know, you, you simply cannot occupy these spaces. You know, it's really, really difficult. Yeah. From, from an ELM perspective, um, what we're looking at is essentially using the mycelium as a scaffold. Mm -hmm. um, it's a living scaffold, but we're looking at co-cultivation with bacteria. So this is exactly the kinds of things that Dennis was showing with the bacillus. Uh, we're using a different strain, uh, and we're using a different strain because um, there's uh, literature showing that it has uh, very interesting chemotaxis relationships and has effects on growth, uh, not just in terms of rates, but also in terms of branching, yeah. which we find very, very interesting. Um, I, I think, you know, we need to be looking at the fact that we would probably have to denature this is a very interesting term I like that uh, doesn't you know, essentially means kill, but we, we don't like to use that word. Um, kill the mycelium, but, but, then, but then being able to, so, so essentially what we've made then is you used it to grow a particular scaffold that might have certain kinds of morphological properties, certain kinds of structural properties, but it might be occupied then by different kinds of bacteria, which might be cyanobacteria for doing things like photosynthesis. Um, so so that, that's the kind of thinking at the moment. But I mean, the kinds of things that you're talking about in terms of envir environmental risk are really, I mean, they, they need to be further researched. And, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, the, the kind of, there's a certain hype around particularly MBC, mycelium-based composites, which is, oh, it's great, you, you can decompose them, you know, that's, um, but, you know, 
they do have, you're not just reliant, um, or it's not just the fruiting body that will produce spores. So when you denature your composites, uh, even without a fruiting body, the mycelium can produce these kind of really robust kind of final spores cl called chlamydospores, which can then suddenly, you know, fire up and, and get your mycelium growing again, which is exactly the method that's being used by VUB in the self-healing because the, the sheets are actually killed. But then you're you're localizing environmental conditions to activate the chlamydospore. So you're controlling the activation and also controlling the growth. So that's 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 what they're they're doing there, yeah. But uh, you know the environmental risk there is, of course, you think you're you're shipping out an inert material globally, but actually what you're doing is potentially seeding um, different ecologies with you know non-native species. That can, that, that, would that, be very that, upset about that, this. That, 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 <laughs> that, could, that could suddenly, you know, erupt again. You know, and, and that also, I think, leads towards, you know, the, the idea of, um, in, particularly in mycelium-based composites, that you, you're growing them on an ideal substrate to achieve a particular kind of material property. But that substrate degrading, you know, if, we, if we're thinking about scaling up, which is always the kind of question you, you, you normally get at, how do you scale up? Um, and then you think, well, you know, having scaled up and reached industrial scales that are required for things like shipping computers around the world, um, you know, you can be distorting um, ecologies by having monocultures of degrading material. So I think, you know, for, for, for me, I kind of see the opportunity of working with these organisms about looking towards a hyper-locality and working towards, you know, really the waste streams that are available, even though they might be, you know, currently based on global supply chains. Uh, but, you know, dealing with the idea that you, you source locally, you make locally, you degrade locally. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Right. Cool. I think we're... There was a question here. We take that first, and then if there's not enough time for the ones online, maybe I can persuade the guys to write an answer. But let's take the one in the back. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe I can uh, bribe you with the wine or yeah. a soda. Post my question quickly. Hi, I'm Torben. Thank you so much for three great short but uh, very very interesting uh, keynotes here. Phil, maybe you you were very very close to in your own words denature my question to you now <laughs> but but I'm going to post it anyway because as as you rightly said in any conferences talking about bio-based materials the question about scaling is and so mm. my question is also about scaling mm -hmm. but I think it goes for for the three of you could take take us into the future here just for the benefit of the people not necessarily understanding how do we scale what are we what are we looking at could you put some words mm -hmm. on and maybe some visions on the, the kind of, of production plans that we are looking into, how do we scale exponentially this uh, production capacity in the future when we talk about the materials and, and the basics you're talking about? Yep. I take it that the sort of conventional uh, materials production industry has quite some challenges in looking into the future and what we're, are we talking about sort of Tesla giga plants or Facebook data centers somewhere with giga giga labs that are producing this basic material in order for this to scale for the industry or what are we talking about? Well, I mean, that's certainly one vector. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, n normally when I get posed the question about scaling, scaling up, uh, or scaling the, the, out. Uh, so, so I'm just about to get to that, actually, <laughs> Seraphim. So, because you know, from an architectural context, it, it's always scaling up. Okay, so th there are two two things that I kind of um, hear being inferred talking about scaling up. One is that you know we're we're making studies that are relatively small length scale, and how do you make things bigger? And then the other thing is actually about how do you produce at scale to be able to deal with market demand. Um, but from a, from a kind of social sciences perspective, there, there's a much more enriched understanding about scaling. So they talk about scaling up, but they talk about scaling out, and they talk about scaling deep. And those scaling out and scaling deep actually have nothing to do with industry at all. They're actually to do with society. And I, I find that a much more interesting space to think about scaling um, because firstly, it removes us from the idea that all of this becomes commodified, 
but it also reactivates the fact that um, the technologies we're talking about, okay, you know, of course, we're looking at them through very uh, Western and privileged advanced technologies to understand their dynamics, but ultimately, they are technologies that exist from the beginning of mankind. I mean, fermentation goes right back to the beginning. And that means that from a kind of scaling out and scaling deep perspective, we can talk about societal change, not industrial change. And I think this is really the, the, the kind of crux for me. I might just continue a little bit on that. I showed one, very short, I saw the slide that 50% of the foods are produced from 1% of the companies which is the same on your sector, right? So essentially embedded in our societies with the idea that we have to make big factories to scale. And that works because of cost. When you're scaling up, the cost drops down. So now within the engineering community, there's a, especially for vaccines, the idea of resilience, so economic cost is not the only vector. Resilience for energy, if you have one factory and you close it, what would happen? So the idea of scaling up, because to, to permit, it, it starts becoming heavily contested in academics, still within certain industrial sectors that they have capital assets, it's very difficult to convince them otherwise. I mean, I have failed. But when you go to new products, and the question is, do you want to build one big factory or use 50? or 5,000 facilities becomes interesting from the sector that we work on, and maybe you can produce your biomaterials, we'll have kitchens. You underutilize your kitchens. Like, how about if we start being creative on the assets we have to produce the new materials? And that speaks to, you know, to what Phil was saying. You need an oven. <laughs> but a very short remark to that would be if, if the transition towards a more, let's say, less animal-based diet had the pace we hoped, we would actually have a stainless steel issue. We would not have yes. enough stainless steel to build what we need to really reach that capacity. So, there are some, so we need some creative thinking there as well. And I think that's a beautiful final note for today. <laughs> so before we give the three of you a huge applause, I'm going to hijack the last minute just to announce our next science talk, which is on no November 9th. And we've created this uh, beautiful QR code where you can actually directly sign up. So on no November 9th, we are happy to connect live with Mohammed from Vancouver. And he's talking about resource circularity in the built environment and waste to resource ecosystems. So we're hoping to see many of you there. And then thank you all for participating today. And for the ones of you in the room, I've heard that these guys might be sticking around for a while. Yep. So you can also ask them more questions here. And we'll try to get the questions in the chat answers now. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.